I'm Joe Calkins, and I'm studying the impact of grain boundary properties like misorientation on the small strength of materials. I'm working on this project under Dr. Justin Wilkerson in an online RU at Texas A&M. Here, I'll be using molecular dynamics to test small strength by first void nucleation. The motivation for this study is to analyze complex dynamic collisions like that seen on the left, done by Chen et al., but with simpler models to yield the same results. This parallel is validated by Nguyen et al. in the figure on the right. I set up the simulation to replicate the model from Nguyen et al. using BCC tantalum with a 20 by 20 unit cells in X and Y and 30 unit cells in Z, the direction of deformation. The bicrystal is initially relaxed for 50 picoseconds at 300 Kelvin at zero pressure to allow it to reach equilibrium. This GIF shows the progression of deformation from 0 to 30% strain along the z-direction in 150,000 time steps spanning 300 picoseconds. The stretching along z is evident, much harder to see, some twins form along the microstructure momentarily, then move up and out of the simulation box. Within the box, the atoms respond to tensile stresses by separating somewhat, making vacancies and eventually voids in the material. The stress at first void nucleation is well correlated with spall strength, so I measure the time and stress at which the first void nucleates. To systematically find a void, I use Wigner sites analysis. This populates a reference configuration on the left with Wigner site cells, an example of which is shown center for a BCC lattice like tantalum. These cells surround each atom with a volume conjoining its neighbor cells to fill the entire simulation box. In the reference configuration, each cell contains exactly one atom in the center. Then, use this same lattice of Wigner site cells on each frame of the deformation and see how many atoms remain in each cell. Most cells will still have only one atom in them, but when a vacancy appears, one cell has zero atoms in it and another cell has an additional interstitial atom. Using the definition from Chen et al. that two adjacent cells represents a void, I find the minimum distance between any two empty Wigner site cells, and if that distance falls below one tantalum lattice parameter, then those cells represent a void. This graph shows the stress-strain relationship along the z-direction. Because each time step applies a uniform increase in strain, the z-axis also represents linearly increasing time. The overlaid blue scatter plot and the secondary axis on the right represent the number of vacancies at each time step to show the effect of vacancies and voids on stress. There is a serrated nature of the stress drain curve, which seems unusual at first. However, the drop-offs in stress make sense when looking at the vacancy count. The first valley in stress occurs when the first vacancy nucleates at about 9% strain, allowing the lattice to relax. Then the second vacancy nucleates around 15% strain and causes another steep drop-off in stress. The stress further falls until finally at 18.4% strain, the vacancy count jumps to 12, two of which are adjacent, making the first void in the material. This second graph shows the number of vacancies after the first void nucleates, where the count quickly jumps into the 70s when the material is heavily deformed around 20% strain. The reason that each of these increases in vacancies decreases the stress so much is that the effect of void volume on a material depends on the concentration of vacancies, not so much the number. As the simulation runs in a volume of about 0.4 cubic picometers, each individual vacancy plays a major role in stress relaxation. That is why the serrated nature of the stress drain curve is so pronounced, and this is consistent with what is seen in other nanoscale studies. This sample is a bicrystal with a misorientation angle of 73.77 degrees. The next step in my future work is to run the same simulation on more bicrystals, varying the misorientation angle and studying its impact on the spall strength. I expect to get results similar to Chen et al. shown here, but with a simple tensile model rather than a dynamic model of stress waves on a thousand times more atoms. Upon verifying this, I can move on to study other grain boundary factors that play into a material's ball strength. Finally, here are the two reference papers that I talked about. Thank you.